The Old Man and the Sea by Ernest Hemingway. Part 3 He was asleep in a short time, and he dreamed of Africa. When he was a boy, and the long golden beaches, and the white beaches, so white they hurt your eyes, and the high capes, and the great brown mountains. He lives along that coast now every night, and in his dreams, he hears the surf roar and saw the native boats come riding through it. He smells the tar and oakum of the deck as he slept, and he smells the smell of Africa that the land breeze brought at morning. Usually, when he smells the land breeze, he woke up and dressed to go and wake the boy. But tonight, the smell of the land breeze came very early, and he knew it was too early in his dream, and went on dreaming to see the white peaks of the islands rising from the sea. And then he dreamed of the different harbors and roadsteads of the Canary Islands. He no longer dreamed of storms, nor of women, nor of great occurrences, nor of great fish, nor fights, nor contest of strength, nor of his wife. He only dreamed of places now and of the lions on the beach. They played like young cats in the dusk, and he loves them as he loves the boy. He never dreamed about the boy. He simply woke looked out the open door as the moon, and unrolled his trousers and put them on. He urinated outside the shack, and then went up the road to wake the boy. He was shivering with the morning cold, but he knew he would shiver himself warm, and that soon he would be rowing. The door of the house where the boy lived was unlocked, and he opened it and walked in quietly with his bare feet. The boy was asleep on a cot in the first room, and the old man could see him clearly with the lights that came in from the dying moon. He took hold of one foot gently, and held it until the boy woke and turned and looked at him. The old man nodded, and the boy took his trousers from the chair by the bed and, sitting on the bed, put them on. The old man went out the door, and the boy came after him. He was sleepy, and the old man put his arm across his shoulders and said, I'm sorry. Kiba, the boy said, it is what a man must do. They walked down the road to the old man's shack. And all along the road, in the dark, barefoot men were moving, carrying the mast of their boats. When they reached the old man's shack, the boy took the rose of line in the basket, and the harpoon, and gaff, and the old man carried the mast with the third sail on his shoulder. Do you want coffee? The boy asked. We'll put the gear in the boat, and then get some. They had coffee from condensed milk cans at an early morning place that served fishermen. How do you sleep, old man? The boy asked. He was waking up now, although it was still hard for him to leave his sleep. Very well, Manoline. The old man said, I feel confident today. So do I, the boy said. No, I must get your sardines and mine and your fresh base. He brings our gear himself. He never wants anyone to carry anything. We are different, the old man said. I let you carry things when you were five years old. I know it, the boy said. I'll be right back. Have another coffee. We have credit here. He walked off barefooted on the coral rocks, 
to the ice house where the bays were stored. The old man drank his coffee slowly. It was all he would have all day, and he knew that he should take it. For a long time now, eating had bored him, and he never carried a lunch. He had a bottle of water in the bow of the skiff, and that was all he needed for the day. The boy was back now with the sardines and the two baits wrapped in the newspaper, and they went down the trail to the skiff. Feeling the papoose sand under their feet, Aunt lifted the skiff and slid her into the water. Good luck, old man. Good luck. The old man said. He fitted the rib lashings of the oars into the thole pins, and leaning forward against the thrust of the blades in the water, he began to row out of the harbor in the dark. There were other boats from the other beaches, going out to sea, and the old man heard the dip and push of their oars, even though he could not see them now. The moon was below the hills. Sometimes, someone would speak in a boat, but most of the boats were silent except for the dip of the oars. They spread apart after they were out of the mouth of the harbor. And each one headed for the part of the ocean where he hoped to find fish. The old man knew he was going far out, and he left the smell of the land behind and rode out into the clean early morning smell of the ocean. He saw the phosphorescence of the gulf weed in the water as he rode over the part of the ocean that the fishermen called the Great Well. Because there was a sudden dip of seven hundred fathoms, where all sorts of fish congregated, because of the swell the current made against the steep walls of the floor of the ocean. Here, there were concentrations of shrimps and bait fish, and sometimes schools of squid in the deepest holes. And these rose close to the surface at night, where all the wandering fish fed on them. In the dark, the old man could feel the morning coming, and as he rode, he heard the trembling sound as flying fish left the water, and the hissing that their stiff set wings made as they soared away in the darkness. He was very fond of flying fish, as they were his principal friends on the ocean. He was sorry for the birds, especially the small delicate duck terns. That were always flying and looking and almost never finding, and he thought the birds had a harder life than we do, except for the robber birds and the heavy, strong ones. Why did they make birds so delicate and fine as those sea swallows when the ocean can be so cruel? She is kind and very beautiful. But she can be so cruel, and it comes so suddenly, and such birds that fly, dipping and hunting, with their small sad voices, are made too delicately for the sea. He always thought of the sea as la mar, which is what people call her in Spanish, when they love her. Sometimes those who love her say bad things of her, but they are always said as though she were a woman. Some of the younger fishermen, those who used boys as floats for their lines, and had motor boats, but when the shark lovers had brought much money, spoke of her as El Mar, which is masculine. They spoke of her as a contestant or a place or even an enemy. But the old man always thought of her as feminine, and as something that gave or withheld great favors. And if she did wild or wicked things, it was because she couldn't help them. The moon affects her as it does a woman, he thought. Thank you for watching. This is the end of part three. To be continued in part four. If you like the story, please like, share, and subscribe. See you then.